everyone. I'm uh, extremely delighted tonight to welcome uh, my brother, Arthur Mutambara, to the UCT GSB, who is our main speaker today on this uh, Distinguished Speakers Program. We are here to listen to his, uh, his views about politics, about the economy, about how uh, his philosophical uh, and uh, you know, political ideas have shaped the way uh, he developed to be where he is today as a, a, an academic, as a scientist, as a business executive, and one of uh, Africa's leading public intellectuals. Uh, we're also here to launch uh, his first book. He has published a trilogy of books, three books. Uh, this is the first in the series. He will reflect on it, will give him some time to reflect on the essence of the book. And then we'll have a, a discussion, himself and myself, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Let me start by introducing uh, Professor Arthur Gusemi Oliver. Mutambara is the former Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Zimbabwe. He's the author of a new trilogy in search of the elusive Zimbabwean dream and autobiography of thought leadership. This is the book, if you've not seen it. Mutambara was one of the three principals who created and led the government of national unity. The other two were former Prime Minister Morgan Sangarai and President Robert Mugabe. As the Deputy Prime Minister, his key functions included assisting the Prime Minister in policy formulation by the Cabinet and supervision of policy implementation by the Council of Ministers. Professor Mutambara is currently the President of the African News Agency, ANA, Africa's first syndicated technology-driven multimedia news platform. He's a chartered engineer, a fellow of the Institute of Engineering and Technology, a professional engineer, a fellow of the Zimbabwe Institute of Engineers, a fellow of the Zimbabwe Academy of Sciences, and a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. He was Director of Electronic Payments at Standard Bank in South Africa. In the United States, he was a research scientist at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA visiting professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, professor at the Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, Florida State University College of Engineering, and a management consultant with McKinsey and Company. He has written two electrical engineering books that are widely used in engineering graduate schools in the United States, Europe, China, Japan, and Africa. Professor Mutambara holds a PhD in robotics and mechanotrics and an MSc in computer engineering, both from the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He graduated with a BSc Honours in Electrical Engineering from the University of Zimbabwe. In 2007, Mutambara was accorded the World Economic Forum Young Global Leader Status and subsequently attended World Economic Forum events from 2007 to 2013 in Davos, Switzerland, China, India, and Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you, Professor Tambara. It's a book about ideas, you know, philosophy, the ideas that have shaped you, the philosophy that has sh the values, and um, uh, you know, it, it documents your, your journey as a person, as an academic, as a, a scientist, as a, a, a business executive, and, and as a scholar. I was quite fascinated by, by the, you know, by the, the topic, you know, the, so the title of the, of the book, Elusive Zimbabwe Dream. Now, the thought that came to my mind is, elusive or is this, this is finished, you know, the dream is in tatters. Be, can it be rescued? I think we should always keep hope alive. And we should always keep working hard. We should never give up. Uh, yes, we're going through a very rough patch in Zimbabwe. Yes, we're going through, you know, some difficult times politically, economically and socially. 
but let us keep hope alive. In terms of the change, I, I see the old man uh, in there. He has managed to defeat all of us. I must accept defeat. <laughs> <laughs> but biology is going to defeat you also. <laughs> I mean, whichever way it goes, the guy is 93. Biology will come in and help us, right? A post Mugabe era is going to be open season. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be hopeful. Um, so in a post Mugabe era, there's no leader in Zimbabwe who will be able to force people to kill for him the way people are killing from Gabe and doing all these crazy things for him. So in a post in Gabe era, whether it's Lacoste or G40 or Changri, whoever, it will be a new day for the country. So let us keep hope alive. That's number one. Number two, let's not wait for biology. Let's keep working <laughs> to bring the change ourselves. Um, and and uh, in our different ways. By the way, Zimbabweans, you don't have to be in Zimbabwe to make a difference. You can be here helping those on the ground by way of ideas, documents, by raising resources for the economy. My view is that the diaspora is like money in the bank. Yes, we need on the ground the critical mass on the country to make a difference. But those in Japan, those in South Africa, those in America can be leveraged to make a difference politically and economically. So it's not lost. I think let's keep working to bring about change. Let us keep working to drive the economy. Let's keep hope alive. And also, by the way, South Africa must take a vested interest approach to Zimbabwe. South Africa cannot succeed if Zimbabwe is failing. You know why? An investor sitting in Japan will say, I want to go to South Africa, but how attractive is the region? Ah, oh, there's a problem in Zimbabwe, so I won't go to South Africa. You know why? We're moving away from national competitiveness to regional attractiveness, to regional competitiveness. The region of SADC must be attractive for South Africa to prosper. The region of Sadat must be successful for Botswana to prosper. So as we struggle in Zimbabwe to create a change, the South Africans, the Mozambicans, and the Botswana people must work with us because it is in their interest to have a successful and prosperous region under globalization. Right, thank you. You, you pointed out in your, in your introduction, you know, and rightly so, that the, the situation that prevails in Zimbabwe, political, economic, intellectual uh, situation can be replicated elsewhere on the African continent. How would you, how would you describe the state of, of political and intellectual discourse in Africa today? You know, what is so heartening about this book is that it's a book about ideas. Very rarely does one read a book about, about ideas and how ideas shape society and how they shape reality. And this is the contribution this book makes uh, but how can we ensure that it's replicated across the African continent? Yeah. You know, what is the state yeah. of political and intellectual discourse in Zimbabwe yeah. and the wide African continent? We have a challenge with the death of intellectual leadership in Africa. When you compare our current leaders with the founding fathers, like Kwame Krumah, like Nyerere, like Ben Bela, there's a huge gap in terms of vision in terms of intellect. I'll quote a few things. Uh, Kruber, what did Kruber say? The independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked to the independence of the rest of Africa. That's a visionary who's thinking, it's not enough to be free as Ghanaians. Africa must be free. Further comment, further quote from Kruber. We as Ghanaians are prepared to surrender our sovereignty in part or in total in pursuit of African unity. Close quote. Do we have an African leader who's talking that language? Baby was close to that, but right now in South Africa, I'm sorry, the whole slate is mediocre. The whole slate in Zimbabwe is mediocre. Ben Bela, Algeria, in 1963, what did Ben Bela say? Ben Bela says, we must die early too, so that Rhodesia can be free. We must die early too, so that South Africa can be free. In my mind, when you look at Ben Bela, when you see Nyerere, when you say Kwame Krumah, I don't see our leaders having the same level of intellect, the same level of commitment, the same level of vision as those guys. So we got to work on it across the board. Kagami, Zuma, Mugabe, these are mediocre people, <laughs> below average. I'm not impressed. <laughs> 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 
Now, now one, of, one of the, the themes that, that emerges very strongly in, in this book, especially during your student years, university years, you and your associates, uh, is a very strong antipathy towards corruption, to uh, authoritarianism, one party state, even though you originally had endorsed uh, President Mugabe and uh, Zado PF, you changed your minds subsequently because of what was happening. What was the turning point? What triggered the change in your, yeah. in your attitude towards uh, you know, Zado PF? I, I see one of the, the passages I found interesting was your, you had a slagging match uh, with the president, a public slagging match at a graduation ceremony in 1990. What, what triggered this change, this about him? You see, if you think about it, in 1980, Mugabe was like a god, very eloquent, very rich country. So we're overly impressed by Mugabe and Zanu, Ngomo and Zaku. Of course, maybe we're young, so we're easy to, easy to impress. But then as we got on, then we had Kukura Hundi Matebelele. Then we didn't know when we were in high school the details. But when we were invested around 889, we getting the details. Then we were wondering, how can our revolutionaries our freedom fighters treat their own colleagues in such a murderous way. We could never understood that that a freedom fighter will slaughter another freedom fighter for political power to entrench themselves. That really shocked us. I mean, we were very naive. We could never imagine the ANC, you know, slaughtering PAC, for example, or something like that. But it happened in Zimbabwe during the Bokuranda period, uh, from '83 to '87. But as young people, we didn't have the details. Uh, but when we got those details, we were really, really depressed. That's number one. Number two, when we got now the information about corruption, the Willow Gate scandal, and the details now of the level of corruption. You know, when we started off with this illusion about Mugabe being what we call the Mugabe exceptionalism, it's not him, it's people around him. So if you, if you read our anti corruption document, we're saying, our president, please, our party. You know, and we were saying, it's, and then we realized, no, 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 it's him. This guy is the problem. <laughs> this guy is the chief looter. <laughs> it, when we discovered that, that the corruption was right to the top, it involved Mugabe. We were really gutted. We were really shocked because we had so much faith in him. The third point was around the one-party state and their brutal approach. But the way, this is why they attacked Zap, they didn't want an opposition party. Mm. So they battered Zap into submission, so they were one party state, a de facto one anyway. So that lack of democracy, that lack of appetite for discourse really shocked us. And so that was the turning point for us. Gugra Hundi, corruption, the lack of democracy, and Mugabe himself being the chief looter. That really shocked us. <laughs> and we said, we don't want any one party state anymore. We want democracy, one more party. Those, those were the issues there as young people. Yes, now, I mean, you were his staunch critic, but you subsequently worked with him and served with him uh, under his leadership mm -hmm. in the, um, the government of national unity from yes. 2009 to 2013. Yes. You know, President Mugabe, he, he treated us all sorts of mixed emotions across the African continent. He's seen as a hero, some see him as somebody who's a, a, a strong opponent of imperialism, some see as a liberal. There are all sorts of emotions that he triggers. So that explains the fascination with him. How, how do you describe working with him? And, you know, how do you describe working with him? What is his style of leadership? And can you also say very briefly, if, you know, what, what do you think were the achievements of the, the government of national unity? You know, they had a defined mandate. It's a very short... Uh, duration, um, but do you think you made you made any impact? Was it a success? So I started at the end. Our major achievements were around the new constitution. I mean, if there was one thing that we can say we achieved, it is the new constitution in Zimbabwe. The only challenge is that it's not being fully implemented. But the document is a major improvement to what we had before. Second achievement: we stabilized the economy. In five years, we didn't have the strategy we have right now in Zimbabwe. Mm. The economy grew in those five years. And there was some degree of stability within the economy. Our failures were around political reforms. <coughs> that comes to Mugabe's strategy. You know, uh, Mugabe, in all my discussions, Professor, we never discussed the economy. 
or talk about economic insights. It was also about politics. Mugabe is the consummate politician. Every time he's thinking about how to outplay you. So, <laughs> our mistake was that when we got into government, we were very keen to work on the economy, save the country, and do all the lofty ideas. Mugabe was like, how do I get rid of these fools? <laughs> From day one for five years, was plotting. Mugabe has read The Prince by Machiavelli. He, I think he reads it every mm. night. <laughs> <laughs> the Prince. And, and he walks the prince. He leaves the prince. And so to him, it's about power and power retention. Forget GDP. Forget per capita income. Do I have the power? So in his style of leadership is about how do I maintain political power? As Robert, by the way, in Mugabe's structure, it's Mugabe number one, family number two, ZPF number three, Zimbabwe number four. You hear me? ZPF is number three. Because if you see what he's doing in the country, it's not good for ZANU-PF. Mm -hmm. If he wanted ZANU-PF to survive, he would have stepped down, put his guy or woman there, support them, like he already did. Like what has happened in Mozambique or Angola. A supervised succession. Then your party will be there forever. He cares about himself. So all this G40 and uh, Lacoste are his creation to make sure there's no successor. Because as long as they're fighting, he's the answer. <coughs> if he becomes too strong, he pushes you down. Remember, Nagab was very strong in 2004 and pushed him down, pushed Mamju up. Mamju became very strong. Nagab up, Nagab is getting. <laughs> so, as a result, they are always balancing each other and he's his own successor. <laughs> he's, that's why I say biology is your best hope. <laughs> so, in my mind, uh, there's obsession with power. And an inordinate lust for power. Mm. As an end in itself, others use power for good. Like Agam is trying to use power for good. Not my friend. And by the way, I feel President Gabe is a good example of what I'm talking about in terms of documentation. You know, whether you like him or not, Robert. Mm -hmm. Robert Mugabe has been there from 1960 when he came from Ghana and joined the ADP. That's 57 years at the front seat of Zimbabwean politics front seat of African politics. Don't worry about his policies, but he's been there from 1960 to now. But there's not even a single pamphlet by Robert Mugabe. No, written nothing. It did 57 years of interesting material. I just did five years, I've already got three volumes. <laughs> <laughs> Clinton has four books, Hillary three books, Thatcher three books, Blair has written, Obama three books, he's writing another one, you know, uh, mm. there's a writing culture in America, there's a writing culture in Europe, our leaders, I would want to read this book, I mean, yeah. you don't have to support him, you, yeah. it's very interesting to see what was yeah. he thinking, yeah. during Google, what were his views, yeah. when was he in jail, what was he thinking, when was he working with Mutambara, what was he thinking? <laughs> right? So, so you know, but again, because of the obsession with power, because of the inordinate lust for power, he's missing legacy. Mm. Because the book is about legacy. The book is about how you are remembered. So if he drops dead today, there's no book by Mugabe. There are books about him, but that's different. Yeah. We want your own insights. Um, so anyway, to summarize, uh, he's a very interesting character, very British, very Anglophile. He liked me because I went to Oxford, so he, he, he respected Oxford. And, so he, he's an Anglophile and a snob. <laughs> In his mind, he's like, how can Morgan, you know, this chap take over from me with little education? I mean, that's, you ask about the character yeah. of a man. Yeah. And, he, you know, he's, very, he, he's more English than the English. He can talk tough, but he loves the English. Yeah? Uh, and so on and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we, shall we, we'll take a, a round of questions. Uh, we have a roving mic. Um, um, Pamela, there's a gentleman in the back there. We're going to take it as We're going to do sections by sections. See, most yes. of the time you already. First of all, um, congratulations on uh, a really wonderful CV and, and very impressive. 
uh, book, I should think, and read it, please. Um, you mentioned that one of your um, beliefs is that execution is the key. Now, during the period that the MDC was in the unity government, if execution was a prime objective, and you had the power, and you had the majority, I think, why did you not, at that stage, when the economy of Zimbabwe was already largely under the control of indigenous people, not change the legislation? Because one of the reasons the economy is in such a mess in Zimbabwe is the lack of foreign investment. And it's been discouraged because of that legislation. You had the chance to do it. Why did you not do it when you had the time and the power? Okay. Uh, very, very briefly. Oh, can we take okay. three questions okay. at a time? Okay, okay. 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 let's get a gift. Okay, no problem. Yes. Okay. 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 Um, thank you so much for the book. I mean, genuinely, it has been a very tremendous inspiration for us young people. But I think the question that I have for you, or rather, I think maybe you could share it close with us, is that um, for me, primarily, is about understanding how the diaspora can organize for power. I mean, you mentioned a lot about how technology is changing society and how you know, we're looking towards a different transition. But the really, the challenge is how best you know, can we tap into this transition you know, for the benefit of our nation. Because we see that wherever we are across the globe, we are except at home. So the challenge really is now how do we organize around those capabilities to ensure that any can transformation and change that we can find. Next one. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, my question is, do elections matter? Um, Zimbabwe is coming up for an election and there's a lot of voter apathy. Should we go out and vote at the diaspora? Does it matter in your opinion? Take another one? Or should you want to take those? Uh, we'll take prof one. Yeah. Okay. yeah, take one more. So there was a lot of inertia, a lot of time wasted negotiating every issue. So it's a very slow government. And then you can even see from the British experience, once you have an inclusive government or a coalition government, it's very sluggish because you have to proceed by consensus to bring everybody on board. That's why we're very slow and we didn't do as much as we wanted on execution. Indigenization is the same. Um, the idea was good, we wanted to implement and so on. But ZANPF took it as their signature policy. And it was very difficult to move around and stop that. And also, but remember, the, the value of indigenization was there as a policy. So the key issue is that coalition governments, more so like ours, where we're coming from three different angles. People used to gel each other, lock each other up, work in the same government. It's not the best way to run the country. The diaspora, number one, 
we need a critical mass at home. So I always encourage those with guts to take a pledge and go home and be part of the political fray in Zimbabwe. And again, don't have what I call the paralysis of analysis. You know, Professor, if it was 1960 and we had uh, Gavin Becky, Walter Sisulu, and Mandela, they sit down and they say, gentlemen, and there'll be some ladies, let's do a SWOT analysis. Can the Boers be defeated? Analyze. Use your McKinsey or, you know, GSB models. And analyze. Do a SWOT analysis. Can the Boers be defeated? What will be the answer? Don't even try. They cannot be defeated. Go back to your law school. Go back to... So, don't overanalyze. The feasibility studies are oversold. I know we're in a business school. But uh, don't do a feasibility study. Take a client and go home. I went there, I became deputy prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little example of no gas, no glory. <laughs> anyway, so number one, some of the people in the diaspora must take a plunge and be part of the political activism on the ground. That's one part. Others who stay, keep Zimbabwe on your mind. Work on policies, raise resources, encourage people from here. You don't have to be in Zimbabwe. If you're at McKinsey, if you're at Harvard, if you're at the GSB, why don't you do research for people in Zimbabwe? Why don't you raise money for the country? So the diaspora, number one, some must go home. Two, those who remain, the Jews. Take care of Israel from New York, from Los Angeles. The Indians do the same. The Chinese the same. The Ethiopians are doing well. So as a diaspora person, it doesn't matter where you are, as long as Zimbabwe is on your mind. Another point, do things from here for your country. Build a house in the village. You know, when you die, we take your body to the village and there's no structure. You guys. No and by the way, when you die, you are not in control. The old villager, the old grandfather will say, bring the body home. My son, my grandson cannot be buried in Jobek or buried in New York. He must be buried in Gutu, buried in Cholocho. And you have not built a structure there. If you are going to allow your body, your dead body, to be taken to Zimbabwe, to the village, please, Comrade Diaspora, build a structure, build a heart, <coughs> so that your body will go into your heart, you know. So what I'm emphasizing is when you are here in America, in Europe, also contribute to infra personal infrastructure. In Harare, have a house in Harare, have a house in the village. Bring development in your village. I spent 10 years in the village, 10 solid years. There must be evidence in that village that there was a rocket scientist who came from here. Otherwise, if there's no correlation, what is the meaning of that? By the way, you must move from success to significance. That's right. When you're successful, like I was at MIT, that's, we must have significance and impact in the village. That's significance. Change a country. That's significance. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What is higher stage? Aha, Professor, I want to teach these people. That's the old stage. Self-actualization was so yesterday. We changed it. They didn't tell you. We changed it. When Maslow did the work, he put self-actualization at the highest stage. But we've since revised it. There's a stage called self-transcend, go beyond self, leave a legacy. When you are dead, what's your legacy? Go beyond self, self-transcend, leave a legacy. It's a higher stage than self-actualization. So even from the diaspora, you can self-transcend, you can leave a legacy in Zimbabwe, in the village. So be inspired as the diaspora, you can do things from afar. Elections do matter. So that's why we must create an environment of freeness and fairness for our elections, so that every vote counts. So electoral reforms are very critical, but we may not get them. But for purposes of mobilizing and uh, organizing our people, we must make sure we register. People in the diaspora, if you have an opportunity, go home and register and go and vote. Ideally, we must allow the diaspora to vote. But Mugabe feels that you're going to vote wrongly. You know, the diaspora will vote wrongly. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> it means you vote for the opposition. So the Malawians vote, the Mozambicans vote, the Zimbabweans are never allowed to vote. 
and we are saying no taxation without representation. How can the diaspora help the country with remittances when you don't allow them to vote? So respect their contribution to the economy by giving them the birthright, which is their vote. But it won't happen next year. But eventually we must allow the diaspora to vote. So voting matters. Uh, we must change the laws. We must register. We must organize and not agonize. Organize, don't agonize. Elections do matter. Why do stars fail? Uh, politics is very different from business, Professor. Business is very clear. You don't destroy value, you build value. In, in politics, you destroy value and still stay. How, how can Mugabe be there after 37 years, after ruining the economy? If politics was a, was a normal science, you know, GDP has been smashed, but the guy is still there 37 years with failure. Whereas in business, you'll be fired, right? The old government will go under. You know what Mugabe says? If you ever head to a country which was closed because it is bankrupt, <laughs> <laughs> there is never a country which was shut down because of bankrupt. Go spend money, go find money. That's the psychology of Mugabe. There is never a country which was closed because it ran out of money. So keep spending. Anyway, I said this to my brother about stars. So when you join politics, be prepared for irrationality. Be prepared for. Uh, the not so smart guys being on top, you know, being clever uh, does not get you too far. Sometimes it works against you. <laughs> so, so be prepared to mix and mingle. Um, um, so being smart is not necessarily an advantage. Politics is a very um, situational, very subjective uh, field. However, having said that, don't buy the language that says politics is a dirty game. It's a dirty game by someone has played that game. And if you don't play it, the not so clever guys will play and ruin everyone else. Because remember, politicians decide on policy, education, and everything. So we must have some of our best minds in politics. Mm -hmm. Because politics does matter. So don't, yes, it's a difficult game, but it must be played. I'll stop there so that I can get more questions. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll take uh, this side. Uh, Good evening, Prof. Uh, Good evening. My question, uh, it's not a question per se, but I just wanted you to comment uh, uh, on the issue that uh, we have had uh, several discourse on the goings on in, in Zimbabwe. And uh, when you mentioned uh, that you just went back to Zimbabwe and became a prime minister, in our discussion, there are some who raised the uh, issue that uh, uh, where did Adam Tambara came from and just came to be a, a prime minister? Which MDC was he represented? And uh, what it then he made was uh, Adam Tambara is the creation of Mugabe also. Because uh, at the end, your, your kind of uh, arguments and your kind of strategy was sounding too theoretical and uh, uh, too academic to be realistic. And even up to now, uh, your, your presentations and part of your biography sounds a bit uh, too academic for most of uh, the people who might uh, be uh, prepared to listen to that or to read that. Maybe perhaps you can comment on sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, writing is a difficult task, Professor Mutambara. In writing your book, how difficult was it to choose the best words and use them well? Thank you. That's a difficult one. So there's so many people here. I can't give everybody the mic. So. Uh, good evening, Professor and others. Uh, I just want to ask a Professor, uh, is commenting about post in Ghana, Zimbabwe. But, uh, and you, you seem to see glory. But I see <coughs> there is a tribal hegemons that are there in Zimbabwe. And uh, someone might think tribal hegemons are between the various insurance, which is not true. There is further to that of the Zulu, 
and characters. And those hegemons have even costed and even lifted Mugabe to remain where he is. But I also want to comment, how do you see we solve uh, equality in Zimbabwe, given the situation of tribal hegemony? I'm taking this one from the situation how Blawai was destroyed because purely they were fixing people from other Thank you. All right, take uh, another one. <coughs> Thank you, Prof, for that eloquent presentation. I have two questions that I want to ask you. The first one is, you know, we have seen your successes in Oxford, did mechatronics, uh, computer engineering, robotics and all that, you went to MIT. My first question is, how has all that been relevant to Africa? We haven't heard of any innovation by Mutambara to change our circumstances. We've been discovered it's mainly from Europe, from China. What is your study of robotics brought to us? Because now we are delving into politics. I don't know that robotic politics yeah, or something. <laughs> Take this, uh, perhaps on the, on the Becky uh, sure, sure. issue, ch um, uh, Prof, if you could just describe the, the state of bilateral relations between between South Africa today and, and Zimbabwe, and how different is that from the, the Mbeki era? Okay. Um, let's start with the Mbeki. You know, he tried his, but he was a good negotiator, good, good facilitator. He did a good job, and Zimbabweans must be grateful to him. Although some felt that he was a bit biased towards Mugabe, but uh, I was there, you know. Um, he did a fairly good job. He also had antipathy towards Morgan to some extent, um, but, you know, the negotiations were done by Zimbabweans. He was ostensibly a facilitator. So whatever weaknesses are in the GPA, we take responsibility as Zimbabweans, because he was just a facilitator. And by the way, I'm a strong supporter of Mbeki, and I believe South Africa at some point is going to apologize to Africa for removing him. You know, a time will come when you say, I think we erred. Just like Krumah. You know, Krumah was taken out by the CIA and, da -da -da, and went into exile. Eventually, they brought him back and buried him. He's now worshipped in Ghana. And so I think time will come in the fullness of time where we're going to get the apology from you, Professor. Uh, on behalf of South Africa <laughs> for taking out Brother Mbeki. So anyway, so, <laughs> anyway, so on balance, he did a good job, and um, we take responsibility for whatever weaknesses are there. Now, you must remember bilateral now. Um, why ANC, why Mbeki, and them have a soft spot for Mugabe and Zan? During the liberation struggle, the ANC was closer to Zap. Okay, and Zan was closer to the PAC. In fact, some of the NC guys in Zambia thought uh, Ngomo was going to win, Zap was going to win. And they were shocked when Zan won. Modise used to refuse to train with Zanla fighters. Now, you guys, we don't train with Zanla, we deal with Zebra. So when Mugabe won in 1980, the NC was in trouble. Mugabe now had a country, Zan now had a country. And did ANC never begged Zan. So Oliver Tambo and Tambo Mbeki went to Harare. And Mugabe says, oh, so, <laughs> what do you want in my country? <laughs> when I was fighting, you didn't support me. You supported Zap. Now I am the president. I'm in charge of this country called Zimbabwe. What do you want? You bet the wrong horse. So he gave them a lecture. Becky and Tambo, Becky, Tambo, Oliver Tambo, giving a lecture by Mugabe. They say, okay, I forgive you. It's okay now. What can I do for you? So you can imagine Becky and the NC are beholden to Mugabe because, one, they didn't support him, 
And then after he won the country, he then supported them you know, in a way. So, so there's a debt of gratitude that Mbeki owes to Mugabe personally and the ANC to Mugabe. So no wonder why you find the appetite, the Mbeki question, where they cut Mugabe's slack and they're soft on him because of that forgiveness they got from Mugabe. And then Mugabe helped them with uh, independence and so on and so forth. So as liberation movements, they have their little things going on. So Mbeki was very close to Mugabe intellectually and also because of that history. Now, Brother Zuma, not so. So the relationships are okay, but not as dynamic as they were under Mbeki and Mugabe. They're good, but um, President Zuma is not as close to Mugabe as Mbeki was close to. Mbeki was a Pan-Africanist. Mbeki spoke about the African Renaissance. So Mbeki was very popular in Africa. Mbek was very popular in Zimbabwe. Your fellas, these fellas running the country here, are very inward looking, very narrow, very shallow. And, and I mean that. So, so whereas Brother Mbeki was a pan Africanist, Brother Mbeki was a revolutionary. And we're waiting for that apology. <laughs> uh, for taking out. Mechatronics, hey, my brother, the books are here. Hey, by the way, we're not selling them, but we're, just, we're showing them. Uh, we, we build our rockets, we build our robotics and everything. The contribution to knowledge is there. There are two books here. One is my PhD plus two years of research produced a book. Then the other thick one there is a book I was using to teach. It's used today at UCT in America, in Japan, to teach three courses in electrical engineering. That's a contribution to knowledge. Knowledge is global. So the Mutambara contributes to robotics, that's a contribution to your village. Because this contributes to the world. So you must be grateful that Mutambara is advancing the frontiers of knowledge for the world. So I've done it. <laughs> now, uh, now, let me talk about this thing. You know, you know, my view about education, my view, Professor, when you train as a scientist, when you train as a medical doctor, when you train as an engineer, when you train as a business person, you don't have to stick to the area you trained in. Education is about training your mind. That's good. It's about sharpening your mind. What you do with that mind is neither here nor there. Mm. You know? So as a medical doctor, you can venture into journalism. You can venture into politics. But you might have to read harder than those who train in those fields. Mm. So don't feel constrained that I went to school, I studied physics, so I'll die in physics. No! <laughs> Science, physics, teaches you to think in a structured manner. So I'm, a, I'm trained to think in a structured manner. So I can run an economy very systematically because I'm trained to think. So because I'm a robotics mechatronics guy, it doesn't disallow me from the politics of Zimbabwe, of Africa. So I want to encourage everyone. You know, you take a course, finance is my major, economics is my major, physics, law, knowledge is global. Don't be constrained. Some of the best lawyers did physics first and then went into law school. Some of the best doctors started off in biology and, 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 and so on and so forth. So let us have a view that says knowledge is global. The sky is the limit. What education does, what professor gives you, are the research skills, a structured mind, thinking capacity. What you do with that mind is that the yen or there. So, I will not be constrained by mechatronics. I will be a political gangster. <laughs> if need be. Because I can think. I'm structured. I've got research skills. So, I can still go back to rocket science. But because the politicians are messing up, I'm feeling empty. But by the way, the question is, for example, I was teaching at MIT, the smartest kids in the world. And yet, in my village, there's no drinkable water. I'm, smart, I'm teaching the smartest kids in America at MIT. In my own village, my grandfather has no food. My grandmother has no food. What is the meaning of life? What is success? 
being a professor at MIT is success. When in my village, people have no food. Remember the meaning of life, the reason for our existence, significance as opposed to success. So in pursuit of significance, I, I left rocket science for a minute to solve the problems of the country. After that, I'll go back to rocket science. After Mugabe is gone and we have democracy. But don't feel constrained. Tribalism is a tough one. Uh, in here in South Africa, tribalism is an issue. In Zimbabwe, it's an issue. It's an African problem. We must work on it. But uh, our politics has a lot of it. And uh, it's a very painful subject. But you're right that it must be addressed. For example, when you look at that Lacoste G40, there's a lot of karangas and zero tribalism going there. Mugabe is just a clever tribalist. Unlike Zobo, unlike Nangagwa, who are clear, foolish tribalists, who are, Mugabe is a sophisticated one. But he's a Zulu tribalist. We know that. And, and so when you see uh, Mnangagwa getting into trouble, Lacoste, like there's a dimension of tribalism involved in there. Of course, then the Shona and the Bele thing. It's a tough subject. We got to work on it and go towards meritocracy where we allow the best person to run the country, irrespective of their race, irrespective of their gender, irrespective of their tribe. But it's a long way. It's a long way to go. And um, somehow, we must address. But I, I, I accept that it's an issue in Zimbabwe. Uh, Ndebele, Shona issues, Kubra Hundi, all those matters, and the Karanga, Manikas, and all that. It's a, it's a very emotional subject because it, people get offended, but it's, it's a real issue. Uh, and you can see Mugabe actually uh, would want a Zulu hegemony, okay? Perpetuate a Zulu hegemony. And, and you see other people are saying, no, 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 let's, you know. Anyway, we can talk about that later, but all this Lacoste G40, there's an element of that involved in that. Um, but actually, you know, I, I see that people are saying, Mugabe to be president, Sekermai to be president, but I supervise those people. So why don't you ask me whether they can organize the peace up in a brewery, these people. <laughs> Nangagwa and Sekaramai to be president. I supervise them. And Grace to be president. She, we didn't even supervise that one. <laughs> <laughs> when she, was, she, was, she was not qualified to be supervised by us. How can she become a president? So anyway, th those are the, the matters. Then writing is very, it's very difficult. You are right. You know what my advice, what I did, Professor, I wrote my stuff, then I gave my friends. Give other people to read. There's something you can't pick up. So once you finish the manuscript, give people who know the subject to read. But make sure that they give their comments to you, and then you decide whether you take it or not. That's good. But make sure you give as many people as possible who are experts, who know the subject. Editors. My work went through about three or four editors. That's why you will not find any mistake there. I can vouch for this book. Because it went through about four different editors. But again, they tell me what they're changing, and I say yes or no. But they look through it. Because writing is very difficult. Bonang. <laughs> Bonang. You, the disaster. But it, she's done a second edition now. She's done a second edition. But she's an example of what not to do. How do you miss up your own birthday? <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you have grammatical errors? Anyway, to young authors, after writing, give your friends to read. Give professor to read. What you do is they put a marker, you know, you know electronically, you can decide whether to accept or reject. But you must know. So I can vouch for my book, professor, because it went through four, five different editors, and then six or so of my friends. And so it's robust. Uh -huh. But writing is difficult. <laughs> where where Atham Gabi? Where did Atham Dabba come from? Read my book. I was a bowler before MDC. I was a short caller before MDC. <laughs> MDC did not make me. In fact, that's why, Professor, my book goes from 83 to 2002. The name Washman does not exist in that book. Here. Because some people have got a short memory. They, they oh, Mugabe, 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 is, uh, is too much. You know. Do you know that I fought Mugabe before you were born? I fought Mugabe when you were supporting Mugabe. So in other words, the history, people are very are historical. In my book, I talk about Morgan Shangri. When we started, 
the students were the revolutionaries. The students were the opposition to Mugabe. Shangri was a spectator. He was my supporter. The first time Shangri is arrested, I had been locked up, I had been arrested. And Shangri wrote a note as Secretary General of the ZSTU supporting me. That's the first time Morgan Shangri was arrested. And you know, my people say he was a good supporter, a cheerleader <laughs> to the revolutionary. That's history. Now I'm his cheerleader now. I cheer him now, yeah? But historically, once upon a time, he was my cheerleader. I was the soldier. So I tell you to read my book if you want to know where Mtambara came from. We are the foundation of the anti Mugabe struggle in Zimbabwe. And then, of course, I came in with my colleagues. And that's book two now, so I don't want to get in book two. I don't want to play up myself. But um, that's the reason why people must write. If you don't write, you have people with short memories writing your history. Right. So I'm in charge of my history. You know, Churchill was asked by a journalist, Mr. Churchill, Mr. Churchill, how is history going to judge you? And Churchill said, very positively, because I'm not writing history. <laughs> <laughs> and he did three volumes on the Second World War. So Churchill is an authority on the Second World War. So he made sure that he wrote. He was lucky when he lost power. He was given documents by the Chief Secretary to Cabinet, all the documents from the war. So he went and wrote the history of the Second World War. So you can say whatever you want about the Second World War, but Churchill's record is done by Churchill. <laughs> so my record is done by Mutambar. <laughs> so I read my book. <laughs> you know where okay. is coming. Uh, Prof, I think we, we, we're about to conclude, but I just want to ask uh, two, two questions, um, which uh, I think would be of uh, significance to, to uh, the audience. One is a uh, concern about how concerned should we be about uh, the security situation in Zimbabwe today? If the, if the president were to, to, to drop dead, uh, and in the, in the absence of a succession plan, then, what, what are the kind of scenarios that are likely to emerge from a security viewpoint in Zimbabwe? And then the other one is, um, some, in some circles, you know, there's been a talk that, or speculation, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, you, you do this fantastic work, you write these books, um, you are preparing yourself to run for president, to go back to politics. How, how true is that? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> anyway, let's start with security. It is very, uh, it's very bad in Zimbabwe right now. Because the G40 and Lacoste, those guys will never work together. These guys will hate each other so much. Right now, Mnangagwa is suing Jonathan Moy for $3 million for defamation of, of, of that video. If you read what Jonathan is writing on his Twitter, he hates Mnangawa's guards. The Lacoste people, the war vets, they hate the G40. So if Mnangawa was to drop dead today without succession, it's a very dicey situation. Because those guys, both groups have guards. Both groups have asked access to the army and they've got sympathizers in the army. So this is why I say Mugabe has no interest in ZANU PF. Mugabe is not interested in the country. Because if he had interest, he would have solved it to make sure what you're asking me is not a matter. Because if he dies today, it's a problem because these groups are not reconciled. There's no successor. And Munagawa, who is under who he is undermining right now, if if Mugabe dies when Munagawa is acting, Mugabe takes over for 90 days. And he's got 90 days to take care of business. And take care of this means maybe to hitting this G40 fools. <laughs> right? So it's very, very fluid, very, very precarious because there's no clarity on the successor. Who is there? There's Mnangawa, but Mugabe is undermining him. Mpoko is there, but Mugabe doesn't want him there because of your tribalism. The Debeni don't become president. Yeah, I'm saying it, I mean, that's the Zimbabwean story, right? He's just there's a figurehead. The only player is Mnagawa, right? And Mnagawa is undermining Mnagawa and pushing, probing Sekaramai. But if he dies today, Sekaramai is not a vice president. Mnagawa is vice president. So Mnagawa gets 90 days. 
before they go to Congress to choose a president. Because our constitution says if the president dies, the guy who was acting vice president is in charge of the country for 90 days, and in that 90 days, the party that had a president will provide a president. Mm -hmm. So, theoretically, if Mnagabu was acting, he becomes president for 90 days, then Zanu PF must go to Congress and produce a leader. Now, producing a leader with these groups as they stand is a tough one. If he cared about the country, he could make his mind that he wants Sekeramai to be president or whoever, and then organize a succession like Nyerere did. You know Nyerere put in me, and super, Nyerere was in charge of the country, by the way. When he was a stooge, Nyerere was chairman of the party running from outside, but Mugabe wants to be in front. So if he cared, he would put a guy, woman, whoever he wants, and then supervise the transition then at least we can guarantee stability and security. But as it is right now, because they're fighting, and Mugabe does not control the army, don't believe the height. He's got Chiwenga, but Zimondi and Mujuru are not Mugabe, I mean, sorry, Zimondi and Perens Shiri are not Mugabe's people. They can go to G40, they can go to Mamiju, whatever. So both groups have access to weapons. So uh, uh, there are challenges. So, ah, the, if, if that cannot be resolved internally, what, what's the scope for external players to, to influence what's going on? Um, for example, China. Do, uh, there's a speculation that China will, will have the, the final word on, on what is happening, given the extensive interest China has in Zimbabwe and the active interest that is taking in what is going on there. Yeah, the, the Chinese have a preference that they prefer the Nagawa. Uh, but uh, now, I think Nagawa was in trouble for several reasons. The British also were, were warming up to Nagawa, which actually worked against him. And Nagawa was also playing tribal politics. Now it's time for the Karangas now, and they were now celebrating as Karangas. Uh, you know, and the Zeus reacted. I um, get the, the tribal thing. So again, it, it created pretty issues. So the, the Chinese are keen on Nagawa. But yeah, I'm not sure what they're going to do now with the current state of affairs. The problem with Robert Mugabe, he wants no one. He wants himself. <laughs> Don't be under any illusion that he wants Sekiramai or he wants grace. He wants himself. That's why I emphasize biology. <laughs> biology being a savior in this. So anyway, uh, hopefully it will be resolved internally. Yeah. And maybe SADAC South Africa can assist quietly and so on. Or maybe the opposition can also unite because the opposition is also divided. There are almost two alliances going on uh, in the country. Uh, it'd be good if there's some kind of uh, unity and uh, coherence in the opposition, but uh, it's a troublesome area. Am I preparing to run for the presidency? <laughs> Why not? Why not? I, disguised in any way, no, I'm, I'm doing books now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm concentrating on documentation. <laughs> I'm retired, but not tired. Um, but if they don't solve the problems, they will leave me with no option but to come out of retirement and declare my interest. Uh -huh. So I keep my options open as a Zimbabwean. But for now, let's buy books. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. On, the, on that very candid uh, and outspoken note, thank you very much. It's been a, a very great, combative, educative, fascinating discussion. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, this is a small token of appreciation from us. And perhaps some details about the book. Okay. Where, where is it available? Yeah, the book is there. It's outside there. there. It's uh, on discount. The soft cover is 300. The hard cover is 400. You can pay cash. You can swipe. You can scan. If you don't have any, any of those, you can take your name and your phone number and give you the book and you'll pay. I hope you're honorable Africans. <laughs> so you pay later. But if, that is if you're honorable. But anyway, the options are there outside. <laughs> All right. Because, and then I'll find them. I'll send the books. That's why I do this. Send. <laughs> <laughs> Not run the country.